Um, so we're going to look at uh, chapter four today. Uh, this first section is uh, mostly definition and fairly straightforward. Um, I, you know, once again, I'll leave the chat open. If you guys have any questions or you can speak up, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Um, all right. So uh, the first few things here, we got event, simple event, and sample space. Uh, this isn't too terribly bad. So event, um, example of event would be, um, it says a set of outcomes would probably experiment. So that would be, say we have a pair of die and we're trying to roll um, a sum of four. Okay. So there's multiple ways to roll a uh, sum of four and those different ways would be the simple bit. So the, the event would be rolling a sum of four. The simple events would be each individual way you do that, like a one and a three, a two and a two, and a three and a one. Okay. So there's multiple ways of doing that. And then we have a sample space and that's a set of all possible outcomes. So if we had we're rolling a pair of die, we could have a one and one, one and a two, one and a three, one and a four, one and a five, one and a six, two and a one, two and a two, two and a three, so forth all the way to you know six and six. Okay. Um, so that's just kind of a you know definitional type thing. Um, now we have this classical approach to probability. This sounds very fancy but it's not near as uh, fancy as it sounds. Uh, we're familiar with this. Let's just go back to say a single die. If we wanna find the probability of, say we wanna find the probability of rolling a two, okay? Well, if we wanted to find the probability of rolling a two on a die, there's only one way that we can uh, roll a two and there's six different possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So the probability of rolling a two would be one six, and that's what they're saying here in the classical approach. The number of ways A can occur, so the number of ways we can roll a two is just one, and then the total number of simple events, so that would be the one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's six of those. So, uh, you know, it's pretty standard of uh, way we think about probability. Um, so they're calling it the classical approach. Um, now, we're gonna use this complement uh, in, uh, I think it's section four, three, but they do mention it in this section. So if we have event A, um, you know, say we use the same example, let's say event A is rolling a two, what event A complement would be? The book uses uh, A with a bar on top of it. I use a little dash in the notes. That would be rolling everything but a two. So that would be a one, uh, a three, a four, a five, and six. Okay, so it's everything but the two. Okay, so a complement is just kind of the, more or less the opposite. So everything but what's in A. Um, all probabilities have to be between zero and one. So let's think about, you know, when we talk about, say, the chance of rain. Um, it would be silly to say there's a 120% chance of rain because it can't get any higher than 100% or one. And it would be silly to say it, there's a negative 10% chance of rain because it can't get any lower than zero. Um, so same thing is with probabilities. It's gotta be between zero and one or, or zero and 100%. All right, now we're gonna start looking into um, uh, some of these problems. So this nine and 10 is talking about uh, subjective judgment. So here we have, it says, assume the 50 bursts are randomly selected. Use subjective judgment to describe the given number of girls as specifically low, high, or neither. Okay, so let's think about if we had 50 births. What do we expect for the number of boys and the number of girls? Okay, so, you know, girls and boys are uh, born, you know, at a rate of 50-50. So if we had 50 births, we would expect roughly 25 girls and 25 boys. So if we had 50 births, and we had 47 girls, we would, would you consider that specifically high, low, or neither? Well, that would be high. I mean, that's way more girls than we would expect. We're thinking, you know, roughly 25. Um, so 47 is definitely a lot more than what we'd expect. Okay. And then number 10, they say 26 girls. Well, what we would expect is 25. So 25, 26, yeah, that's, those are pretty much the same. So that would be neither high nor low. So, what they're trying to, to get us to start thinking about this problem is where we change from significantly uh, high or low to neither, okay? So when we said 26, 
you know, that's real close to the middle and 47 is very, very high. There's obviously a, a, a change uh, somewhere where it goes from neither to significantly high. Is that going to be at 28 girls or 30 girls or 32 girls? At some point, we're going to go from neither to significantly high. We haven't learned all the, the ways of doing that yet, um, but that's what this problem is kind of building towards. You know, uh, this is, you know, giving us the two extremes, but as the course goes on, uh, we will uh, define that, you know, more uh, precisely. Okay, um, now this table for one, we have uh, this uh, results from a uh, drug test for job applicants. And we have, you know, two groups that the subjects uh, are using and then non-users. And then whether they got a positive test or a negative test result when they took the drug test, okay? We're gonna use this for uh, several problems today. Um, so let's see what they ask us about this. So this number 22, it says, find the probability of selecting some, someone who got a false positive. So a false positive is this group. Okay, so we had 25 false positives. We'll put that over the grand total of 555 to get our probability, 25 out of 555. Okay, so, and then it says, who would suffer from a false positive? So let's figure out what a false positive is. Um, so a false positive is someone that does not use drugs, but got a positive test result. Okay, so that's a pretty crappy group to fall into. Um, you know, you're not a, you're not a drug user, but you got a positive test. I mean, like that's kind of the worst of both worlds. Um, you know, you you got a positive test, but you also don't use drugs. So that's like you know, <laughs> I'm trying to be a little funny there, but you know, like that's a pretty crappy group to be in. Okay, you don't get to use the drugs and you and you get a positive test. So yeah, that's certainly a, po a problem if you're trying to get a job, you're not a drug user, but you got a positive test result. So yeah, that's that's not a good place to be. All right, and then uh, 24, it says, find the probability of selecting someone who does not use drugs. Okay, so here when we say do not use drugs, that's everybody in this row, okay? So it's not just one, it's everybody in that row. So we would take that row total of 505 and put it over the grand total of 555. Okay, so everybody in that row over the grand total. All right, any questions on that one? Are those two? All right. Now we have the birthday problem. So uh, we're talking about guessing birthdays. Um, on their first date, Kelly asked Mike to guess the date of her birth, not including the year. Okay, so they're on the, these this two people are on their first date and they're trying to, um, the guy's trying to guess the girl's birthday. Well, obviously, if they're on the first date, they probably don't know a heck of a lot about each other. So the first question is, what is the probability that Mike will guess correctly? Well, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the, uh, You know, there's 365 days in the year, and if he guesses correctly, or what's the probability he's going to guess correctly, he's just choosing one day out of the 365. So, you know, it's going to be one out of the 365. And B, it says, uh, would it be unlikely for him to guess correctly on his first try? Oh, for, of course. I mean, you know, he only has one out of 365 chances. Um, so, yeah, that would be pretty lucky to, to guess that. And then C, it says, if you were Kelly and Mike did guess correctly on his first try, would you believe his claim that he made a lucky guess or would you convince he already knew? Um, well, I mean, he probably did a little research before the date. You know, he might have got on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, figured out um, when her birthday was. Uh, so he probably did a little pre-date uh, pre uh, research. Um, and then D is kind of a, a silly one. Uh, if Kelly asked Mike to guess her age and Mike's guess is too high by 15 years, what is the probability that Mike and Kelly would have a second date? Okay, so if he guesses her age too high by 15 years, probably not a very good chance of a of a second date. Okay. All right. All right. Now um here we're talking about odds. Um so let's see what we have here. So they say a modified roulette wheel has 40 slots. One slot is zero, another is double zero, and the other numbers are uh, one through 38 respectively. Um, 
you're replacing you're replacing a bet that outcome is an odd number. Okay, so let's see how this is set up. We have these numbers one through thirty eight. Obviously, half of those are odd, half of them are even. And then we have this zero double zero, and those don't count as odd or even. Okay, so if we have thirty eight numbers, uh, half of them are odd, so that would be nineteen of them would be odd. So the probability of winning is the nineteen odd numbers over the grand total of 40 slots, okay? So nothing new there. Um, now we're gonna change that into odds. So this B, it says, what are the actual odds against winning? All right, so we can go odds for or odds against. So what we're saying is we have 40 slots, 19 being uh, possible winners for an odd number, so if we have 40 slots and 19 being winner, that means we'd have to have 21 losers. Okay, so 21 and 19 will give us the 40. So when they add actual odds against, that's where we're getting the 21, the 19. 21 ways to win, 19, I'm sorry, 21 ways to lose, 19 ways to win. Okay. So we're just kind of changing the form of the probability of 1940s, uh, and we're taking the number of ways to lose it to the number of ways of winning. If they add ask for odds um, for winning, it would be 19 to 21. We just switch the order. All right, now, it says when you uh, bet that the outcome of an odd number, um, the pay payoff odds are one to one. Okay, so one to one means that you, every time you bet a dollar, you get a dollar back if you win. So when they ask us how much would profit would you uh, make if you make a $16 bet and win, it would the payoff would be 16. It's just one to one. For every dollar you bet, you that's what you win. Okay. Now, this D uh, it says how much profit should you make on a sixteen dollar bet if you could somehow convince the casino to change its payoff odds so that they're the same as the actual odds against winning. So let's let me explain what they're doing here or what they're asking. So they're telling us that the payoff odds are one to one. So you know if the game was uh, Fair, meaning that it, you know the actual payoff should be one to one. Um, it would be more like you know flipping a coin. Say we had a game. If we uh, flipped a coin, if it landed on heads, uh, you guys gave me a dollar. If it landed on tails, I would give you a dollar. Okay, so we would play that forever. I mean, sometimes you guys be up a little bit, and sometimes I'd be up a little bit, but overall, it's going to be even because you know coins fifty fifty, and we're just giving the dollar back and forth each time. This game is not quite fair because we have these two zero and double zero that are the house wins. So if you you know um, bet odd or even, that's great. Except if it lands on zero or double zero, the the house wins both the odd and the even bets, and nobody gets any money. Everybody loses except for the house. Okay. So those are the, the house numbers. So what they're doing here is saying, okay, how much? should they pay you if the game was fair? They're, the casino is never going to do that because that's where they're making their money, but let's figure out you know, what they would do. So if we made a $16 bet and they paid us uh, you know, fairly, we would take that odds against winning, this 21 to 19, put that in terms of a fraction, so 21 over 19 times 16, and they should pay out to be fair 1768, okay? So obviously they're not going to do that because you know that's that a dollar sixty eight more is where they're making their money. So they don't want to do that. Okay. Questions on that? I won't have too much in odds. They just actually entered this, uh, just added this back to the course this term. Um, I have a you know a few problems in the homework and maybe you know one or two on the quiz, but not not very much at all. Uh, I have a question. Um, sure. we, what are we doing to make sure that the odds are um, equal? Say, can you say that one more time? And on option B, what are we doing differently to get that number 1768? Okay, so what they're just trying to say if you know the the house is what they're saying is the house is paying one to one odds, um, but that is in the house's favor. They should actually be paying a little bit more because, um, well, if, if if they wanted to be fair, um, because we have these numbers one through thirty-eight, 
And if we just had those numbers and we're betting odd or even, then pay off one to one would be correct or fair. I should say not correct, fair. But they added these upper, upper, uh, other couple numbers that are neither odd nor even, and that's where the house makes their money. So if you you know walk in there, you and I walk in there, and you bet odd, I bet even, and it lands at zero or double zero, we both lose, and the house wins. So what they're saying is, um, you know, Ms. Diaz is how much profit should you make on the 16th of if that if you could somehow convince the casino to change the payoff odds so that they're the same as actual odds against. So what that means is making it fair. So since there's a this slight advantage to the house, there's 21 ways to lose and 19 ways to win, that favors the house. So we have to take that in consideration. We have to pay in that same ratio. So we take that 21 to 19, which is you know, the, the favors the, the house and multiply by whatever we're betting to get that 17. So if they wanted to be fair, um, it would be 1768 that they pay out. Does that? Yes, that make makes sense? sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's basically how the, um, the uh, uh, casino makes their money. So all the games they have are slightly in their favor so that they're making a little bit money here and there. And, you know, over time they make enough to stay in business and, do quite well. Okay, so they know exactly how they're going to do over time. Okay, so let's look at uh, four two. So um, now we're going to start looking at more of the heart of the, this chapter, and we're going to start seeing some key words um, and phrases. And when I have these key words and phrases in the notes, I've highlighted them or made them bolder in caps or some of all of it. So this first thing. When I, you know, have this keyword for using addition rules or as bolded and capitalized and exclamation points, there's a reason for that. Okay. Um, so as we go through this chapter, we're going to get more and more of these keywords and we're going to use those when we get to the quiz and the test that to let us know what type of problem it is and to do it correctly. So it's a what to do and how to do it. Using those keywords will tell us what to do. Okay. So we have to look out for those. So this is the first one is. You know, the, the key phrase or current keyword is or. Okay. Now we have two um, formulas for the uh, addition rule. Uh, this first one, uh, the A plus probability of A plus probably B minus the probability of both. And then if they're mutually exclusive, this is going to be the probability A plus the probability of B. Okay. If they're mutually exclusive or disjoint. So we have to figure out if they're disjoint or not to determine which formula to use. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out what disjoint means, and then we'll go back and we'll do an example of each one of them and see uh, what the difference is, okay? So this mutually exclusive disjoints is two events that cannot occur at the same time, all right? So let's look at an example that, that would be disjoint and then not disjoint. So this first one are be disjoint. So look at these two events, uh, riding a bike and driving a car. Can we ride a bike and drive a car at the same time? No, okay, that's that would be ridiculous. So we can't drive a car and ride a bike at the same time. So those are two events that are uh, that don't overlap, they're disjoint. Okay. Now let's compare that to the second set of events, driving a car and texting, okay? We have people that drive a car, we have people that text, and then we have that overlap that both drive a car and text, which we're not supposed to do, but it's happened once or twice or every single day. Okay, so again, riding a bike and driving a car cannot be done at the same time. Driving and texting, even though it's illegal, it does happen, and there is overlap there. Okay, so those would be uh, uh, would not be mutually exclusive or disjoint. Okay, all right. Um, now let's see how that plays into doing these problems. Okay. So we have uh, our drug test again. In example A, it says if, if one of the test subjects is randomly selected, find the probability that the subject had a positive test result or a negative test result. Okay, so we have our positive test. There's our keyword of or or negative test result. Okay. So for the um, the first thing we have to do is figure out if these are uh, disjoint or not. So if we take a drug test, can we have a positive test result and a negative test result on the same test? No. Okay, we can either have one or the other, we can't have both. 
So these would be um, mutually exclusive or disjoint. Okay. So that tells us to use um, that second formula. That is um, the probability of A plus the probability of B. In other words, probability of a positive test plus the probability of a negative test. So if we look at the positive test, that's everybody in this column. Okay. So we have 70 there over the 555 in the total, grand total. So that's where this piece comes from. And then the probability of a negative test is everybody in the second row or second column, sorry. So we have the 485 over the 555, which comes up there. Now, if we add those two together, we get 555 over 555 or one. Now let's think about if that makes sense or not. So what we're asking, what's the probability of having a positive test or negative test result when we take a drug test? Well, those are the only two outcomes. You either have to have a positive test or a negative test result. So therefore the probability of that occurring is one, it's, it's 100% because those are the only two options. Now let's compare this to um, this. Let's see if I can fit all this on one screen. Not really. Okay. Let's look at example B. It says if one of the test subjects is randomly selected, find the probability the subject had a negative test result or does not use drugs. Okay. So again, we have our OR. So the OR is our red flag for addition uh, rule. Now in this case, we have to again see if these are disjoint or not. So we have a negative test result and does not use drugs. All right, so let's think about that. If you're a non-drug user, uh, would it be possible to have a negative test result? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, that's what should happen. If you're not a drug user, you should have a negative test result. So those definitely should, or definitely could happen at the same time, okay? So these um, are not mutually exclusive or disjoint. So we have to use the other formula. Okay. Now, um, so that comes out to find the probability of a negative test does not use, and then the probability of minus the probability of both. All right, so let's go up to the table to figure that out. So we got negative test and does not use the first thing. So we have probably of the negative test result, which is everybody here. So that's the 485 over 555. Okay. And then, um, they want us to find the probably the subject is not used, which is everybody in this row. So we have the 505 over the 555. Okay. So we have those two so far. Okay. And now the last piece, they want us to find the probability of a negative test and does not use. So when we say the probability of a negative test and does not use, that has to be both. Okay, so that's just 480. That's a person does not use drugs and has a negative test result. So it has to be both. So that's gonna be the 480 over 555. And that's where this piece comes from, okay? Okay, now if we can figure out uh, the answer to this next question I'm gonna ask, it'll make this a lot, simpler than it is right now. And my question is, why are we subtracting off this last piece? Okay, so let's figure out why we did that. So what we did is we said, okay, we found the probability of a negative res test result, which is this column, and then the probability the subject is not used, which is this row. Now, what happened is this 480 people have been counted twice. They were counted as a negative test and as a subject is not used. So we counted that 480 people two times. We don't wanna count them twice, so we subtract them off once. Okay, does that make sense? Now, the first problem, let's figure out why we didn't do that. We had a positive test or negative test. Well, the positive test was here and negative test was here. There was no overlap. 
if there's no overlap, nothing gets counted twice. And um, we don't need to subtract anything off because nothing's been counted twice. So that's what we're looking for. If we have two objects or two um, uh, events that don't overlap, we can just find the, the probability of each event and add them together. But if there is overlap, that overlap is going to be counted twice. So we have to subtract that off once. And that's the difference between the two formulas. Are they, is there uh, no overlap or overlap? If there's overlap, we need to subtract off that overlap because it's been counted twice. Okay. Any questions on that one before I go on? I do have a video of uh, another addition rule example here. If, uh, you know, if this, you know, if you want another example of it later on. Okay, so let's look at uh, this next rule, which is the uh, multiplication rule. And the difference here is now our keyword is and. So we looked at or, and or rep, uh, represents or uh, red flag for addition, uh, addition rule. Now we're talking about and, and that's the keyword for multiplication rule. Okay, once again, we have two formulas. One of them when they're independent, which is the second one, and the top one is when they're dependent. Okay, so this is when they're dependent. Okay. Um, now we got to figure out what the difference is between independent and dependent, what, what that means. And that will tell us which one of the cases to use. Okay. So <clears throat> independent events, two events that, you, uh, that, that one occurring does not affect the occurrence of the other. Okay, so let's see uh, these two examples and see the difference here. So if we have event A and event B, uh, A is having a baby girl and B is rolling a four on a die. Whether you have a child and it's a boy or a girl has no effect on how a die behaves and vice versa. If you roll a die and you know doesn't change the sex of your child. You know, it's still, those are completely different things. They have no, no effect on each other whatsoever. So those would be independent events. Okay. Now let's look at dependent events. Okay. So here, um, we have, it says, assume you have a bag of candy with four red candies and four blue candies. All right. So we have this bag, we got four um, red candies and we have four blue candies. Okay, let's see if I can get a blue gear. All right. So we have this bag that has these candies in it. All right. Don't those look like delicious candies, huh? All right. Now we have this first set. It says event A is drawing a red candy. Okay. Now we have a total of eight candies there. Obviously, four of them are red. So he's reaching this bag and randomly select one out. The probability that we're going to get a red is going to be four out of eight for that first event. So that's going to be four out of eight here. Okay. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I take a candy out of the bag, the first thing I want to do is eat it. Okay. I don't care if it's red or blue. I want to eat it to see if it's any good. So once we do that, we're going to have one less uh, red. I'm sorry. Yeah, one less red candy. So whatever one we select is going to be gone. Okay. So that guy's no longer there. Okay. So when we go to event B drawing a second red candy, there's only three red candies out of the remaining seven. So the probability of the second one being red is three over seven. Okay. Now let's start all over and do that again in the second example. Okay, so we have our four red and our four blue. Okay, now the uh, event A is drawing a blue candy. Okay, so the probability of drawing a blue candy is four over eight. Okay. Now, when we draw that blue candy, we're going to do the same thing. We haven't tried a blue candy yet. It's got to be delicious, so let's try it. Now we have one less candy in the jar. So when we go to event B, the probability of drawing a second red candy, we're gonna have four red out of the seven 
So it's going to be four sevenths. Okay, now notice that these two probabilities, the three sevenths and four sevenths, are different. They're both drawing, finding the probability that the second is a red can. Okay, but it depends on what happened originally. So in the first case, we drew a red candy out, ate it, so it changed the makeup of the bag to bag of three red and four blue. And the second time we did it, we drew out our blue candy first, which left with us four red and three blue, or seven out of seven. Okay, so it depends on what ha what's happening first to figure out what the probability is occurring to the second one. Okay, so we take a red one out first. We have one less red, so we're we're heavy on blue. And the second one, if we drag the blue out uh, first, that's going to eliminate one blue, so we're heavier on red than blue. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Why that matters? Any questions on that? Okay, so when they say dependent, this in this case, it depends on what happened previously. All right, so let's see how this um, plays out when we go to our drug uh, test example. <clears throat> so uh, it says if two of the 550 test subjects are randomly psyched, we find the probability that they both had false positive results. So we have both false positives. Now, the word and is not used, but it's inferred. Okay, so when they say both, false, both had false positive results, that means the first has to have a false positive and the second has to be a false positive. So, you know, the, the keyword and, it can be stated or implied. In this case, it's just implied. All right, so the first part of it here is it says, says it's two, uh, assume the two selects are made with replacement. All right, so let's look at with replacement. With replacement means that it's independent. So let's think about our candy, candy example. If we pulled a, a candy out of the bag and whatever it's red or blue, it doesn't matter, and we put it back in the bag, that would be with replacement. We'd still have the same number of red and blue. We'd still have four red, four blue. Okay, so anytime we do with replacement, it doesn't matter what we take out, as long as we put it back in, the makeup of the bags remains the same. And that's what we're doing here. So anytime we see with replacement, that means independent. So we can use our, our, um, our independent formula, which is just the probability A times the probability of B. So we wanna find the probability of a false positive, which is 25 out of the 555. So that's where that comes from. Okay. Now we're putting that that uh, false positive back in there. So the makeup of the bag or makeup of the table is exactly the same. So when we try to find the probability of the second one being a false positive, it's the same thing. It's 25 over 555. So we have that again. And that comes out to be 0 0.002029. Um, on the homework and quiz, quite often they'll ask, um, is that likely to or unlikely to occur? And our cutoff is at 5%. So if it's less than 5%, we're going to call it unlikely. If it's greater than 5%, likely. Okay. Unusual, unusual, however they, they state it. All right. Now let's do the same problem. But now it says the two selects are made without replacement. So now when we take out that false positive, we're keeping it out, just like the candy. We're going to take the candy out, we're eating it. So we, uh, the makeup of the bag is different, okay? So without replacement means dependent, okay? So we have to change formulas, okay? All right, so the first thing we have to do is uh, find a false positive, okay? So that's what we just did a minute ago. And the false positive is the 25 out of the 555. Now let's look at what this means. Okay, so one of them is in terms of A's and B's and the other is in terms of false positives. So how this is read is the probability of B given that A has already occurred. Okay, so let's think back to our uh, candy problem. So we're saying, okay, what's the probability of the, the uh, second one is red given that the first one was red? So that takes into consideration we've taken one, the first red out and eaten it, so the makeup of the bag has changed. 
So in this particular problem, it says, find the probability the second is a false positive, given that the first one is a false positive. So we've already taken a false positive out of there. So instead of having 25 false positives, now we have 24. And we also have one less than the total because we've taken that, um, that false positive out, just like we did the candy. So we're going to have to do that countdown where we have one less false positive, one less than the total. Any questions on that? Okay. So good. it seems like I'm. I'm sorry. I was okay. myself. It's a little late. So it seems like from what you've been explaining, the, the math behind it is fairly simple. It's just keeping track of what you've done so far in order to not screw your math up. Because it's really it's simple math. You're just dividing. Yep. The whole time. Yep. You just got to pay attention to whether you're doing with or without replacement, so that you know if you have to subtract one off there or not. Um, so it, the the difficulty is in the details. You got to you know that's why you know like for instance here you know I have it in caps. You know without replacement means dependent because you have to pick that up or otherwise you're going to do the wrong thing. And same thing above. You know, with replacement means independent. That's important. So these little subtle details is where the problems occur in this. If you can pick up on those subtle details, um, it's not too bad. I know you just said it, but for the with replacement, that means de independent. And then the without replacement means dependent. Could you just like explain one more time what it, what exactly it means? Okay. So let's go back to our um, candy problem because that seems to to be the easiest to understand. So we had the four red and the four blue in there. So if we do it without replacement, meaning we you know, reach in the bag and we pull out a candy, say it's blue, and we eat it, now our bag does no longer has four red and four blue, it has uh, four red and three blue. So the makeup of the bag has changed, so our probability of getting a red or blue the next draw has changed because we've taken one out, okay? So that would be dependent because it depends on what we took out. We take a red or a blue out. So that changes the makeup and, you know, one is heavier than the other after we take, uh, take that one candy out. But if we just replace it, it doesn't matter if we take a red out first and put it back in or a blue one out and put it back in. We uh, still have four red, four blue, so it doesn't really matter what we take out as long as we put it back in. Okay, that yeah, that makes it the the without replacement and with replacement part was tripping me up a bit, but that makes sense. Okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's just a matter, of, you know, have you changed the makeup of the bag or not? You know, so it depends on if you put it back in or not. Got it. Thank you. And that's what we're doing here. So here it says, you know, two selections with replacement, um, and here's two selections made without replacement. So that's a, you know, it's same thing. Are we eating the candy or are we putting the candy back in? Yeah, I'm going to assume the with replacement is specific to what it's asking you about. So if it's asking you specifically about the false positives, the with replacement is going to be specifically the false positives being replaced. Uh, not, not necessarily, um, because let's look at, um, you know, like here we're drawing a blue candy and then the second one was a red candy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. It's just does the, ba the makeup of the bag change or not? Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. So, you know, like here it was, you know, the first one was red and red. So that's what, fine, but the second one was blue and red. So it, it can be either way. It's just long, you just got to keep track of what happened first. How did you change the makeup of the bag? Understood. But your, but your instinct, um, as far as the problems you're going to see in the book, yes, it, it'll almost always be the same thing that you're talking about in the first draw. All right. Um, all right. So let's see. This acceptance sampling. Um, all right, so acceptance sampling uh, with one method of a procedure called acceptance sampling. A sample of items is randomly selected without replacement. Okay, so again, here's you know that means something. Okay, and the entire batch is accepted if every item in the sample is found to be okay. So without replacement, that means we're taking these candies out and we're eating them. Okay. So, as 28, uh, NOAA inspects seafood that is to be consumed. The inspection process involves selecting uh, seafood samples from a larger lot. So, the lot contains 2,875 seafood containers, and 288 of these containers include seafood that does not meet the inspection requirements. 
was it probably that three selected container samples all made the requirements and entire lot is accepted based on this sample? Okay, so let's figure out what we're trying to do before we jump too heavy into this. So we have um, these looks like 2,875 seafood containers, and we need to check them to see if they're good or not. Now, to check 2,875 seafood containers to see if they're good or not is going to take a very long time. Okay, so they don't want to do that because by the time you finish that, probably all the seafood is going to be bad. So what they do is they randomly select um, a few containers. In this case, they're saying we're going to um, select three containers. And out of those three containers, if any of those con uh, containers are bad, any any one or more multiple ones, we don't want any of uh, any of the con seafood containers. If all three are good, we'll take all 2,875. So it's an all or nothing thing. We're going to test three, and if those three are good, we'll take them all. If one or more of those is bad, we don't want any of them. Okay, so it's an all or nothing thing. Um, now, the uh, uh, total we have is 2875. They told us that. They told us we have 288, one, uh, 288 of them that are bad. So if we find the difference between those two numbers, that tells us there's uh, 25. 187 uh, good ones, okay? So the good plus the bad have to equal the total. Now, we're doing this without replacement. So let's see if that makes sense. If we're going to randomly select three containers, if we pull out one and we test it and it's good, and we put it back in there, we may end up accidentally taking it again. So we wouldn't want to select a container that we've already tested. So it wouldn't make sense to put that back in the pool because we may end up drawing it again. So that's why we keep it out because we don't want to test the same one twice. Okay. So <clears throat> again, this would be a dependent case because samples are done without replacement. Okay. So the probably the first one being good, we have 2,587 of them are good out of the 2,875. So we take those two numbers of 2,587 over 2,875. Now we're doing it without replacement, so we've taken that that one out. So we have one less good and one less in the total. So we find that probably the second one being good. Notice that these numbers are uh, reduced by one. So instead of twenty five eighty seven, we have twenty five eighty six, and instead of twenty eight seventy five, we have twenty eight seventy four. So we have one less good and one less in the total. And in the third one, we do the same thing: one less in the uh, good and one less than the total. So we just keep counting down because we keep taking containers out one less good, one less than the total. Okay. All right. Now let's see how this changes in this number 29. Okay. This is going to sound very similar, but they're talking about this 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations. Okay. So let's see what that, what that is. So it says in a study of helicopter usage and patient survival, uh, results were obtained from 47,637 patients transported by helicopter and 111,874 patients transported by ground. So we have two types of patients, some helicopter, some by ground. So part A, this is nothing fancy here. It says if one of the uh, 159,511 patients um, and the study is randomly selected, was it probably the subject was transported by helicopter? So we just have to take the number of helicopter people, 47,000, over the grand total of 159,000. Okay, so nothing fancy there. Part B is where, where we need to pay attention. So it says if five subjects in the study are randomly selected without replacement, okay, so we're taking them out and keeping them out, what is the probability that all of them are transported by helicopter? Okay, so when they say without replacement, that means we're supposed to do that countdown method as we each, you know, find the probably one to the second one, we're gonna have to have one less helicopter, one less in the total. So just like we did in the previous problem where we did this countdown method right up here, same idea, okay? Now, let's think about this, you know? So the first one would be, um, you know, the 47,637 over 159,511. 
and then it would be times 47,636 over 159,510 times 47,635. It gets annoying, right? So we'd have to do that five times. Now, that annoying, you know, writing all those out, that's what they're meaning by this cumbersome calculations. It just gets kind of tedious to write all those down. Now, if we have, if we select, in this case, five, less than 5% of the total, okay, if what we're selecting five is less than 5% of the total, we can treat it as independent. Okay, so let me say that again. If what we're selecting, in this case, five, is less than 5% of the total, we can just take that probably of the first one and just raise it to the fifth power. We can find the calculation much easier rather than do that countdown because the countdown and not doing the countdown almost comes out to the same answer. So we can kind of cheat and not have to do the, you know, cumbersome calculations and still get an answer that's pretty dang accurate. Okay. All right. All right, now we have uh, complements and conditional probability. So we talked about uh, complements. You know, I think I said uh, if event A is rolling a two, then A complement would be rolling a one, three, four, five, or six. Okay, anything but that. Now let's look at this piece here. Okay, and what that says is the probability of A plus the probability of A complement is always equal to one. So the example I just gave was the probability uh, that event A was rolling a two. So the probability of rolling a two would be one out of six. Okay. And A complement would be rolling a one, three, four, five, or six. And the probability of rolling a one, three, four, five, or six uh, would be five, six. So we have the probability of one, six plus five, six is equal to one. Okay. Kind of think of it as the chance of rain. If we say the chance of rain tomorrow is 40%, that means the chance of no rain is 60%. It always has to total one. Okay. Now, what we're actually going to use is this first formula. These are all the same, uh, same thing, just uh, solve for different variables. And the reason why this is useful is sometimes the probability of A is very difficult to find, but the probability of A complement is very easy to find. So instead of dealing with the left-hand side of the equation, finding the probability of A, which is difficult, we just find A complement and subtract it from one, okay? So I'm gonna do a few examples today to show you how that uh, uh, can, can be useful. And our key phrase here for complement rule is at least one or at most X, okay? So that's what we're looking for, okay? All right, so let's look at this example. Um, so it's number five, it says find the probability that when a couple has three children, at least one of them is a girl. Okay, so there's our key phrase. At least one of them is a girl. Okay. So when we say at least one girl, there's multiple ways to have one girl. We could have girl, boy, boy, or boy, girl, boy, or boy, boy, girl. That's all the possibilities of one girl. And then all the possibilities of two girls. We could have girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, girl, or we could have all three girls, girl, girl, girl. So there's a lot of ways to have at least one girl. So that represents one through three. So we'd have to list all those just like I rambled off and then find the probability of each one of those possibilities and then add them all up. Okay, so in that case, there's seven different possibilities. We have to find the probability of each one of those seven and then add them up. Not undoable, but tedious. Okay. So what we're going to do instead is find the probability of the complement. So we're going to do one minus the probability of the complement. So the only other option between, uh, be, besides one to three girls, is having no girls. And there's only one way of doing that, and that's have boy, boy, boy. Okay, so all three are boys. So the probability of boy, 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 Probably the first being a boy is one half. Probably the second being a boy is one half. Probably the third being a boy is one half. So one half cubed. Okay. 
So we take one minus one half cubed or seven eighths. So the, the key here is, um, you know, doing the left hand side, the at least one girl is more difficult than doing the right hand side of one minus the, the, the complement of no girls. Now, in this case, we could do it both ways. Um, you know, one way is definitely more more difficult than the other, but sometimes it's not the difference between one calculation and seven, it's the difference between one calculation and 10,000. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're forced to use a complement rule, and I'll do one of those examples in a little bit. So again, this at least one or at most X, that's what you're looking for. So um, I'm gonna emphasize one more time in the notes, you know, where I see have it bolded or, you know, uh, you know, all caps or whatever, all those are very important in this chapter. Uh, so please pay attention to those because that's what's going to, uh, you know, be what you're looking for in these problems. Okay. <clears throat> okay and then we have conditional probability, same thing. You know, here we have this. Uh, okay, I get a warning every time I kick on my pen here. Um, all right, so the key phrase for conditional probability is given that. Okay, so there's another key phrase that we're looking for. So <clears throat> let's see, uh, we have this formula up here. Let's see how this works and what condition probably, uh, conditional probability is. So we'll um, look at this experiment. It says an experiment to study the effects of using four quarters or a dollar bill. Uh, the students, college students, are either given four quarters or a dollar bill, and we figured out if they decided to keep the money or purchase gum, okay? So we have this table, some of the students were given four quarters, some of them were given a dollar bill, and we kept track to see if they purchased the gum or kept the money, okay? And see if it makes any difference. So let's look at this part A. It says find the probability of randomly selecting students who spent the money given that the student was given four quarters. So we see this given that information. Okay. So if we plug that into the formula, so we have the probability the person spent the money given that they were given four quarters. So in the numerator, we'd have to find the probability of four quarters and spent the money. So given four quarters is this top row and spent the money is the group that purchases gum. So we'd have the 27. It has to both be given four quarters and purchase gum over the 89. That's where this comes from. Okay. And all that is over the probability of given four quarters, which is everybody in this top row. So it'd be the 43 over 89, where is where this comes from. Okay. Now we have a fraction over a fraction. Let's see if we guys remember what we do with fractions over fractions to simplify. We would have to invert and multiply. Does that ring a bell? Let's do my class yesterday. None of my hardly anybody in that class remember doing that. So uh, if we invert and multiply, we get 27 over 43. Now I did that fairly quickly because I don't want you to do using the formula. This formula has always been very confusing to me. Um, I never can remember, okay, is it B, you know, is it, you know, which one comes first, B or A, and then is it, you know, A or B in the denominator, which they always confuse me. It's always a little slow and I have to, you know, think about it every time. So I'm gonna give you a little uh, kind of a shortcut way of doing this. When we read, given that, in whatever it says, in this case, given that the student was given four quarters, we know that's already occurred, okay? So we just look at that part of the table. Okay, so we know that the student, the student had to come from those 43 people right there because they were given four quarters, all right? Now what we're looking for is the probability that they spent the money. So out of that group, there's 27 of them that spent the money out of the 43, which is exactly what we have. Okay. 
I think the formula is more difficult than just reasoning it out. So anytime you see the given that, we can just highlight that part of the table. The rest of the table is meaningless. And then we can say, okay, out of those people are given four quarters, how many of them spent the money? 27. How many is there totaled? 43 done. So I would highly recommend doing it that way. So B is very similar. It says uh, find the probability of a student who kept the money, given that the student was given four quarters. Okay. So we want to kept the money given they're given that they're uh, given four quarters. Okay. So we know that they came from this top group because they were the only ones that were given four quarters. And how many kept the money? 16 out of how many? 43. And we're done. Okay. So 16 over 43. So again, I highly recommend that one, doing it that way. All right, now this one, um, this problem, uh, I'm not going to kid you. This one's hard. Okay, uh, if you have questions, please ask. Uh, the first time you see this in the homework, uh, you'll probably cuss me a little bit because it is a little confusing. So I'm going to, you know, try to go through this in detail and, um, you know, make sure you refer back to this when you see one like this in the homework. All right, so we're talking about uh, water samples here, composite water samples. <clears throat> so the Fairfield County Department of Public Health, Health tests water for the presence of E. coli bacteria. To reduce laboratory costs, water samples from 10 public swimming areas are combined for one test, and further testing is done only if the combined sample tests positive. Based on the past results, there's a 0 0.005 probability of finding E. coli bacteria in a public swimming area. Find the probability that a combined sample of from 10 public swimming areas will reveal the presence of E. coli bacteria. Okay, so let's kind of define what we're doing and then tack this. So, um, you know, these people have to go around and sample water from 10 different public swimming areas. Okay, so let's pretend like it's, you know, our job and we have to, you know, get up in the morning, we drive around these 10 swimming areas, we take a, you know, sample of water, we put it in the back of the truck and go to the next one and drive around. And then we got to go back to the lab and we have to test these for uh, E. coli. So we have these 10 jars. And one option is to test each individual jar, which probably takes some time, money, and effort. But the probability of actually having E. coli in the water is only 0 0.005. It's not very high. So what we're trying to do is see if we can save time and money and take water from each one of those. 10 jars and put it in an 11th jar. Okay, so basically combine those 10 samples, right? Save a little water in each one of them. So if we need to do further testing, we have it. We don't have to drive around again, but you know, basically take whatever half the water out of each jar and put it in a in 11th jar. Right? Now, if we test that jar and it's test negative for E. coli, that means all 10 of them had to be uh, E. coli free. And if that's the case, then we go home early. But if it tests positive, then obviously um, we have to go back and figure out which one or ones of the swimming areas actually had E. coli. So we'd have to go back and test each one of those 10 samples to figure out which ones have E. coli. So their question is, what's the probability of a sample testing positive? Okay. So let's think about what would have to happen for that combined sample to test positive. Obviously, if one of the swimming areas had E. coli, that would test positive. But also, if two of them had E. coli, it would test positive, or three, or four of them, or five, or six, or seven, or eight, or nine, or ten um, would test positive. Okay? Now, that is a tremendous amount of combinations. So let's just think about one, you know, being testing positive. It could have been the first one we sampled or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth or tenth. Okay. If it's two of them that test positive, it could be one and two, be one and three, one and four, one and five, one and six, one and seven, one and eight, one and nine, one and ten. Or it could be two and three, two and four, two and five, two and six, two and seven, two and eight, two and nine, two and ten, or it could be three and four, three and five, three and six. Okay, and then we have any one of the three, any one of the four, any one of the five, any one of the six, any one of the seven, any one of the eight, any one of the nine, and then all ten. So that list of possible combinations there is ridiculously long. 
So we certainly don't want to list all those possible outcomes out, find the probability of each one of those outcomes, and then add them up because we'd be here till next Tuesday. Okay, so what we would want to do is figure out, you know, a better way to do it. So a, a sample test positive, that means at least one of the 10 samples have to have equal on it. So one through 10. Okay, and that's all those different combinations that I was just talking about, a ton of them. Okay. So what we can do is we can use our complement rule. And the only other option between zero and 10, I'm sorry, between one and 10 is none of them have equal on it. So zero. Okay. So we have one minus the probability of none of them have an equal off from the complement rule. So we either have to, you know, sample, you know, do this major calculation for one through ten, or we can just figure out zero. And there's only one way of doing that, and that's all ten of them not to have equal off. Okay. So we either have to do thousands and thousands of calculation or one. So obviously the one is easier. So we want to find the probability that we have ten samples that none of them have equal off. So let's see what we got here. Um, so they tell us that the probability of having equal I is 0 0.005. So the probability of not having equal I would have to be 995. These would have to always total one. So if we add those together, it'd be one. Um, so we want all 10 of them not to have equal I. So we want the 995 to occur 10 times. And that's where this comes from, the 1 minus the 0.995 to the 10th power. So that's 10 in a row that do not have equal I. We subtract that from 1, and we get probability of um, that combined sample to testing positive is only uh, 4% or almost 5%. Okay? So what that means is, you know, 95% uh, of the time we go home early, you know, a little over a little under five percent of the time we have to stay late and test each individual uh, jar to figure out which one had equal I. okay so definitely worth the time all right uh, let me stop for a second see if you guys have any questions on that um, we okay on how that works uh, can you explain the math again and why we're subtracting it from one okay so why we're subtracting from one we're using This idea that the probability of A is the same thing as one minus the probability of A complement. So the probability of A, which is that would be trying to find the probability of uh, at least one uh, of the samples testing positive. So that's in this case one through ten. So that's a very difficult calculation on the left hand side, very complex. Um, but we can find the probability of A complement, which is the probability of none of them having equal I. And subtracting from one. Okay, so that's just a property that the probability of A plus the probability of A complement is one. So we're manipulating that to make our life much easier. Does that help? Yes. Okay. And what was the other question, or does that answer them all? Um, and can you explain the rest of the math again as well? Is as far as where I gave you the point nine nine five so forth? Yes. Okay. So we're trying to ca capture this that uh, probably none of them have equal I. So we want 10 of them in a row not to have equal I. So the probably the first one doesn't have equal I is 0.995, okay, so that's the first one. The probably the second one doesn't have equal I is also 995, excuse my mess here, okay. Uh, and then the third one not having equal I is 995, and to figure out all 10 of them to not have equal I, we'd have to point, uh, multiply 0 0.995 times itself 10 times or raise to the 10th power, which is what I did here, just to make the calculation look a little smoother. And so we figure out the probability that none of them have equal I and then subtract that from one to figure out, um, you know, if the sample test positive or not. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? So the question that it's stating that based on past results, there's a 0 0.005 probability of finding equal I, that's there, this whole time, I, I guess I read it wrong, but that's not talking about the sample size of 10, right? That's just talking about overall. That's just, yeah, that's an individual. So, you know, you know, over the years that you've been doing this, 
uh, when they take a water sample, regardless of where it's taken, the you know chance of having E. coli is low, 0 0.005. Got it. So then the question that it's asking us ends up <clears throat> our answer to the probability of a combined sample of 10 publics. They don't have E. coli. The probability of all 10 not having E. coli is 0 0.0489. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the combined sample, uh, if we, yeah, all that's a, that's, a, I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's ask that question one more time. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm having much trouble wrapping my head around the, what it's asking us. And it's uh, what I'm asking is, so our answer to what they're asking us is that the probability of our sample of 10 public swimming pools not having. No, it's that, that what we're getting, it's that would be the probability of a testing positive. Okay, so the probability of us having 10 in that sample size and that sample size testing positive is 0 0.0489. Correct. Got it. Okay. So okay. even right. even so. if we combine even if we combine 10 samples, the probability of it testing positive is still pretty low. Got it's less it. than 5%. Okay. Okay. I understand. So and that and that, so what we you know what what that's telling us that it's that it's worth um, combining these 10 samples because you know most of the time uh, we're going to get a, a, a negative result, and we can go home early because all, we know all ten of them are, are equally free. So we get to home, go home early rather than testing each individual one of them every right. afternoon. Yeah, got it. Okay, so basically five percent of the time we have to stay late and test each individual one, and a little over ninety-five percent of the time we get to go home early, which sounds lovely. Okay. All right, we good? Question? Other questions? Okay. Uh, do you so, have any examples you know, of this from the homework that we can take a look at together? Um, I can try to find one. Um, I'm not familiar with it right off the top of my head, but I can look at the end of class and see if I can find one quickly. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, let's uh, look at 4.4 and then we'll, I'll see if I can find one uh, that, that does that. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, counting... Um, this section four four. Um, this is this first section. Is, our first thing is talking about the counting rule. So uh, the fundamental counting rule it says that the first event can occur m ways and the second can occur n ways. Together they can occur m times n ways. All right. So let's figure out what that means. So the example I give it says if we have a die that has six outcomes and a coin that has two outcomes together is going to be two times six or twelve outcomes. What they're doing is just saying okay. We have, um, you know, a die and a coin, and if we combine the different outcomes, we can have a one and a head, a one and a tail, two and a head, two and a tail, three and a head, three and a tail, so forth. And if we add all those up, it comes up to be 12. Okay. And we don't have to do that with just two of these. We could have, um, say we had a coin, coin, die. Okay. So a coin has two... Uh, Coin has two outcomes. The second coin has two comes, two outcomes. So two times two is four, and then the die had six outcomes. So four times six, there would be twenty-four cases there. If we had coin, coin, die, right? So it doesn't just have to be two things. It can be ten or twelve things if you want it to be. Okay, just keep multiplying each one of them out. So let's see where that would play into uh, this problem number five. So here we have ATM pin numbers. So it says uh, a thief steals an ATM card, must randomly guess the correct pin code that consists of four digits, each zero through nine. Okay, so we have this standard ATM pin, and they're telling us each digit can be zero through nine. Okay. Um, a repetition of digits is allowed. What is probably the uh, guess on the first try? Okay, so this thief has this ATM card, he's trying to figure out. You know what's the probably him breaking into this ATM thing on the first trial. So the first number we have numbers zero through nine. So there's ten possibilities for that first digit, and then the second digit, same thing. We have ten possibilities, and then ten possibilities again, and then finally ten for the last one. So if we multiply all those together using the fundamental counting rule, we're going to get 10,000 possibilities, okay? 
out of those 10,000 possibilities, there's only one that's the correct one. So the probability of guessing and get it on the first try is one over 10,000. Okay. So the fundamental accounting rule tells us the number of uh, possibilities. And then we can find the, the uh, probability of uh, guessing after that. This next rule is the factorial rule. So it says in different items can be arranged in factorial ways. Okay. So let's figure out what factorial means first. So I have this example here of five factorial. What that means is five, the five factorial means you take the five and you multiply each whole number underneath that. So we have five, four, three, two, one. We multiply all those together. And that turns out to be 120 different possible arrangements. Now, I do not want you to, you know, when it, you know, it gives you five factorial. Yes, you can multiply five times four times three times two times one. Not too bad. But if it was twenty-five factorial, it gets to be very annoying because you got twenty-five times twenty-four times twenty-three, and it's going to take forever. There is a factorial key on your calculator. Okay, so it's just well, it's not it doesn't look like a exclamation point. It's just an exclamation point. So depending on what calculator you have, uh, they're going to be in little different uh, places. Uh, the common ones, if you guys have your calculator handy, like the TI-30X, um, that's going to be under uh, PRB. Let's see if I can put this in here. I'll put it in the chat. So for the, uh, the TI-30, uh, you would hit uh, 5, PRB, and an exclamation point. Okay. And then... Uh, for the TI-8384 model, um, you would, uh, uh, let's see, you hit uh, five, math, P-R-O-B, uh, and then the exclamation point, okay? Um, if you have some other different calculator I, and you have any issues with it, I would just uh, Google the model number and the exclamation point, and I'm sure it'll come right up. Uh, if you have any issues or concerns or can't figure it out, email me and I'm sure I can figure it out. Uh, I'm not familiar with all the calculators, but some of them. I have the 84 in front of me. You said that that one was what again? Yeah, so it's in the chat. It's going to be five and then math. And then PROB and then exclamation point. Got Do you it. see where that is? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So it should be 120. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's see where this is uh, would be useful. Um, so this number nine is talking about grading exams. It says your professor has collected eight different statistics exams. If these exams are graded in random order, what is the probability that the, they are graded in the alphabetical order of the students that took the exam? Okay. So if I only had eight students, um, you know, and gave a paper exam, and uh, they start turning them in, you know, obviously. Any one of the eight could turn the the uh, exam in first, and then he or she leaves, and then any one of the remaining seven could turn their paper in, and they leave, and then remaining six, any one of them, so forth. So that turns out to be eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, or eight factorial. Okay. So if I had eight students, there's over forty thousand different ways they can turn in their their uh, exams and only one of those is an alphabetical order so the probability if you identify at eight students the probability that they would be in alphabetical order is one in forty thousand okay so that's not likely to occur if i have a normal size class of 25 uh that would be you know it will never happen in my career or probably anybody else's career uh you know that's just not going to happen um i find this um, idea very, very neat. In fact, uh, it tricked me, this section tricked me into getting a master's degree in statistics. Uh, I like this counting stuff. I took a course on probability. I thought, oh, this is this stuff I'm pretty good at and it's fun and really interesting. I was like, why don't I go ahead and get a master's degree in statistics? But next thing I knew, uh, I was in a, you know, a computer basement room doing statistical research. And I'm like, this is not where I want to be. I have to get out of here. This is, I got tricked. Um, so I like this section um, and I, because it's kind of, can be kind of baffling. 
Um, I don't know if any of you guys play cards, but let's talk about a deck of cards. So if we have a deck of cards, there's 52 cards, right? Now, if we were going to shuffle those and try to figure out how many different ways we can arrange those cards, it's going to be 52 factorial, okay? So 52 factorial, let me see what that comes out to be. Is 8.06, we'll just say 8, times 10 to the 67th power. Okay, so when we have 10 to the 67th power, what that means is we have to do move the decimal place from here over 67 places. Okay, so that that number is 68 digits long. So what that means is that if you pull out a deck of cards and you shuffle it, well, it, not only has that deck of cards never been in that order, but most likely no deck of cards in the history of time has ever been in that order. That's how many different combinations of cards there are. Okay, so think about that. So of all the cards, you know, decks of cards in the world and over all the years and all the casinos and you know, blah blah blah. blah it's unlikely that any deck of cards after being shuffled has ever been in that order ever before. Okay, so that gives you an idea how out of control this gets quickly. Okay, and that's only 52 cards. You know, if you start raising that number more, it's you know even more insane. Okay, so I think that's kind of neat. Um, all right, so let me get back to what we're doing here. Um, so this next thing is permutation rule. Uh, notice I have order matters, and I'll come back to that here in just a second. We have two different formulas. Okay, we have um, when all items are different and when some are identical to others. So I'm going to do an example of each one of those. Notice that there is a formula for this. I don't want you to use the formula. I want you to use the, the keys on your calculator, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. All right, so let's see um, this number 11. So it's talking about scheduling routes. It says the presidential candidate plans to begin our campaign by visiting uh, the capitals of, of five of the 50 states. If the five capitals are randomly selected without replacement, what is it probably the route of Sacramento, Albany, Junior, Hartford, Bismarck, and that order? Okay. All right, so um, order matters since changing the cities around would completely change the trip. Okay, so think about that. You know, if we're going Sacramento, Albany, Juneau, Hartford, Bismarck, and we start getting plane flights and car rentals and hotel rooms and all that, and all of a sudden they switch around to Sacramento, Bismarck, Albany, Hartford, Juneau, everything's going to be completely messed up. Okay, so order of that you go definitely does matter. Now, to do this, we're going to do a permutation. There's 50 capitals. We're going to select five. So let's figure out how to do that. Um, so it's going to be similar to what you guys did before. So the TI-30, uh, what we do there is we'd have to hit the 50 um, PRB, the NPR key, and then 5. And I put that in the chat. And then for your 8384, um, you'd have to hit 50 math PROB. Five, oops, not five. NPR five and equals or whatever. Okay, so it should come out to be uh, two hundred fifty-four million. Anybody that has their calculator handy have any problems or questions? So there's basically a quarter of a billion different ways that you can select five capitals out of the fifty. So the probability of Doing the Sacramento, Albany, Juno, Hartford, Bismarck is one in quarter of a billion. Okay, well, not very likely. So that is an example when all items are different. Okay, because we have 50 different unique uh, capitals. Now I'm going to do an example when some items are identical to others. Okay, so that would be the next one, which is this 22. It says the classic counting problem is determined the number of different ways the letters of Mississippi can be arranged. Find that number. 
Okay, so notice that when we talk about Mississippi, we have some repeat letters. So, in other words, if we change the letter S with S, it's still Mississippi. If we change I with I, it's still Mississippi. If we change P with P, it's still Mississippi. So, we have to take those combinations where we're switching the same letter with itself um, out of the possibilities. So, that's where we use this new formula. Okay, and let's figure out where those come from, all those values. So we have N factorial, that's just the number of letters we have. So Mississippi has 11 letters, so that's where the 11 factorial comes from in the numerator. Now let's figure out this 4, 4, and 2 factorial. What that is, is looking at the repeats. Okay, so we have the S's, okay? We have four S's there. Mississippi's too small to draw here, right? So we have four S's, so that cor corresponds to the four factorial. We also have four I's, so we have four repeats there, so that's the second four. And we also have two P's, so that's where the two factorial comes in to play. Okay, so those four, four, and two factorial in the denominator is just the num uh, number of the letters and how many times they repeat. There's no real super shortcut there. You just have to use the factorial key multiple times in your calculator. Um, and we find out that there's a little under 35,000 different ways we can re rearrange those letters of Mississippi. Okay. All right. And then our last piece is our combination rule. Notice that here I say order does not matter, and I'll explain that in a second. So here with the Mega Millions, it says the Mega Millions is run in 44 states. Winning the jackpot requires you to select the correct five different numbers between 1 and 75. And in a separate drawing, you must select the correct single number between 1 and 15. Find the probability of winning the jackpot. Okay. So let's see how we do that. So first of all, I got to figure out how many different combinations there are. And when we, you know, pick numbers for the lottery, you know, say we have, you know, pick 2 and 3 and 7 and 22 and whatever 29 and then our separate drawing say we draw uh, one okay it doesn't matter the order that those are drawn when they pick these numbers whether they draw seven first and then three and then 22 and then 29 and then two and then the separate drawing of one or they do two three seven 29 22 and then one it doesn't matter the order that they choose them, it's just, do they match at the end or not? And that's different than switching the cities around, like when we we're trying to visit five out of the 50 capitals, because if we switch cities around, then our flights are messed up, our car rentals are messed up, our, car, our hotels are messed up, everything, okay? Um, so here the order doesn't matter, so we use a combination. Okay, again, do we don't wanna use the uh, formula, we wanna use our calculator. It's very similar, I'll put this in the chat, as before. So in this case, uh, we have 75 numbers to pick five. So it'll be 75 PRB and CR five, or in the 8384, it would be 75 uh, math PRB, PROB and CR five. Okay. Um, so that should, if we Plug that in our calculator, that should give us 17,259,390. So that corresponds to the pick five out of 75, okay, because that's one of the things we have to do. Uh, five, uh, whoops, correct five between one and 75. And then we have to do a single number between one and 15. So that's 15 numbers, choose one. Okay, we have to do the same thing. And that turns out to be 15. There's only 15 ways to pick one number out of 15 numbers. Okay, so if we reason that out, you know, if we only pick one number out of 15, we can choose one, two, three, four, five, up to 15. So there's only 15 ways of doing that. You can plug that in your calculator, you'll get the same thing. Now, so we have 17 million different ways to choose five out of 75, and 15 ways to choose uh, one out of 15. If we multiply those together, we have 258 million different ways, and only one of those is a winning number. So the probability of winning is one in 258 million. Um, 
the follow-up question here is pretty telling. Uh, the follow-up question says, um, how does this result compare to the probability of being struck by lightning year, which the National Weather Service estimates to be uh, 1 in 960,000? So, I don't think too many of us are worried about getting struck by lightning in the next year, but it's just as likely to get struck by lightning 270 times this year as it is winning this lottery. Okay, so let me say that again. It's just as likely to get struck by lightning 270 times this year as it is winning the, this lottery. Not very likely. Okay, so I mean, the uh, it's hard for humans to even comprehend how unlikely this is because things in our lifetime don't happen that unlikely, so that we don't have anything to compare it to. Okay, um, you know, I mean, think about if you heard somebody uh, got struck by lightning 270 times this year, uh, you'd be, oh, that's <laughs> That's something. Um, so that's the same likelihood as winning this lottery. You know, not not very likely. All right. So let me uh, stop there. I have a question on sure the end of that. Just so like I understand the math behind why, like the multiplication by fifteen. If per se, uh -huh. instead of between 